the Ford Cosworth DFV engine etched its name in motorsport history as one of the most dominant powerhouses in Formula One. Although its operation was characterized by simplicity, its efficiency allowed Cosworth to win an unmatched number of races. From 1968 to 1982, the manufacturer clinched 12 out of 15 drivers' titles and 10 out of 14 constructors' titles. This unparalleled dominance shaped the category for the subsequent decades and paved the way for modern-day F1. The acronym DFV in the engine's name means double four-valve, four-valve due to the presence of four valves per cylinder, and double because of its V8 configuration. Its development was based on the straight-four FVA Type E engine. The naturally aspirated 3-liter DFV engine initially produced around 400 bhp, and at the peak of its development, it was able to reach 530 bhp at 11,200 rpm. Following its era of dominance in F1, Cosworth underwent three further updates, first evolving into the DFY, then the DFZ, and later into the potent DFR in 88, receiving a comprehensive overhaul to remain competitive in the category. Additional iterations of the engine, such as the DFX, found success in other categories, such as kart. The first appearance of the Cosworth DFV in competition was with Team Lotus. In 1967, Colin Chapman's team encountered challenges in finding a reliable supplier, particularly after Climax's departure from Formula One. The manufacturer left the category due to the rule changes proposed by the FIA, which increased the engine capacity from 1.5 liters to 3 liters. At the time, Chapman approached Keith Duckworth, a former team engineer who was now trying to build his own engine manufacturer, together with Mike Coston. With the potential for engines to be manufactured within a budget of 100,000 pounds, Chapman sought collaborations with both Ford Motor Company in America and Aston Martin in Britain, with no success. Walter Hayes, head of public relations at Ford Britain, was the next target. This time the talks progressed, and Hayes managed to arrange a dinner with Chapman and Harley Kopp, an engineer and Ford representative. The two developed a plan together and received support from Stanley Gillen, head of the British division of the brand. With this agreement in place, the foundation was set. Cosworth would collaborate with Ford to progress the engine, starting with the fabrication of the FVA engine for Formula 2. If everything worked out, the next step would be the production of the DFV. With the Americans' approval, the project was unveiled in Detroit in 1945, yet the engine wasn't completed until 1967. The DFV debuted on June 4th of that year at the Dutch GP in Zandvoort. Graham Hill took the pole position with more than half a second's advantage over Dan Gurney. Although he led for 10 laps, Hill ended up retiring due to a transmission failure. His teammate Jim Clark had better luck, climbing the grid and taking the victory. 1967 ended up serving as a test year for the engine, revealing various issues to be solved. On the other hand, Clark's three victories showed everyone the great potential of the equipment. The following year, in 68, Hayes realized that there would be no rivals to match the DFV. Ferrari's engines were weak, BRMs were complex and heavy, and Maserati's engines were unreliable. Honda's and Westlake's equipment also fell behind for similar reasons. Among all the engines utilized during that period, only the Repcos used by the Brabham team had the potential to compete, but due to their age, they provided limited scope for enhancements. The excessive advantage raised a red flag at Ford. Even though initially the contract prohibited sales to Lotus's competitors, the automaker recognized that its reputation could suffer in Formula One. The team would become known for winning only against weaker opponents, which was definitely not good for the brand. At the same time, supplying the DFV to other teams would solidify the Ford name as dominant in the competition. At the end of 67, Hayes and Kopp discussed the problem with Chapman and broke the exclusivity in supplying the DFV. With Cosworth as a supplier, anyone in the world could buy the dominant Formula One engines, taking away the advantage that belonged only to the Lotus team. In the subsequent year, their inaugural customer was Matra, a team spearheaded by Ken Tyrrell, with Jackie Stewart at the wheel. The success was immediate, and in the following years, the Cosworth DFV demonstrated its dominance, replacing Climax as the preferred choice on the grid. Almost every team in the category adopted this engine type, including McLaren, Brabham, March, among others. The only exceptions were the traditional Ferrari and BRM, which continued to manufacture their own engines. From 1969 to 1973, all victories were taken by cars powered by the DFV. The engine was very cheap, making it accessible to both large and smaller teams. Besides being economical, the DFV was light, reliable, and user-friendly. With the emergence of ground effect in Formula One, the engine's longevity was prolonged for several more years. 
Since the engine was compact, engineers and designers had extra space in the cars to develop the floor and the bodywork. This allowed them to better develop characteristics that induced the ground effect, giving the customer teams an advantage. The last victory of a car with a DFV engine occurred at the 1983 Detroit Grand Prix, with Michele Alboreto driving a Tyrrell. During its lifespan, the DFV never differed significantly from its competitors. Its design's pivotal aspect was the optimal utilization of its four valves instead of the more prevalent two valves at that time. Even without delivering the same power as a V12, for example, its reduced weight provided a greater weight-to-power ratio advantage against the other heavier engines. A curious point about the model is that even its V configuration was a source of advantage for the teams at the time, as the cylinder angle freed up space at the bottom of the cars. With the additional space, advancements in this area progressed, thereby enhancing cornering ability and aerodynamic balance. The icing on the cake was the engine's ability to integrate into the car's structure. Thus, the engine ceased to be just an installed piece of equipment and assumed a structural role in the models, helping among other things to reduce the car's weight. Recognized as ahead of its time, the engine paved the way for the development of new technologies, forcing teams to improve their models. Aerodynamic wings and spoilers were notable innovations from the DFV era, along with the creation of a gearbox capable of handling the full power output of the engine. In this regard, Hewland dominated the category. At the end of its life in Formula One and with 155 victories in its resume, the naturally aspirated Ford Cosworth DFV gradually lost ground within the teams. Even though it was still a cheap option, the engine became obsolete year after year with the development of turbocharged Renault engines. During the mid-70s, the V12 and flat-12 engines from Ferrari and Alfa Romeo were the favorites for victories. As mentioned earlier, the Cosworth and ground effect combo proved capable of competing against them, enabling drivers like Mario Andretti and Alan Jones to clinch victories and titles. However, the scenario changed when it came to facing turbocharged engines. Following Renault's increasing success, other manufacturers began developing their own turbo engine variants, ultimately leaving Cosworth trailing behind. Keith Duckworth didn't believe in the success of turbocharged engines, and the engineer took a long time to embrace the idea of employing one. This only happened when Parnelli Jones and Vel Miletic produced a turbo version of the equipment for the kart series. For F1, Cosworth produced some improved versions of the engine, in addition to the DFC and the 3.5-liter Ford HBA. In the following years, the brand began to supply only back-of-the-grid teams, such as Minardi, Aeros, and Jordan in their final years. Besides engines, Cosworth also produced other electronic equipment for the grid, never recovering the success of previous decades. After not supplying engines from 2007 to 2009, the manufacturer returned to the category with V8 equipments for the new teams. In 2013, the brand opted to withdraw from competition once more due to the escalating costs associated with the sport. In the following year, Formula One brought back the turbocharged engines, and Cosworth chose not to develop its version. Additionally, none of its client teams could withstand the expenses of the category, leading to their closure one after another. Following Manor Racing's exit in 2013, Cosworth's journey in Formula One concluded alongside the team. Periodically, there are rumors of the brand's potential comeback to the category, particularly with the anticipated engine regulation alterations for 2026, but as of now, nothing has been officially confirmed. If you enjoyed the video and want more information about Formula One, IndyCar, and other motorsports, subscribe to the channel. Questions, suggestions, or tips are always welcome. Feel free to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.